light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words, in one and all and everything, blessed and loved ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. Today I just wanted to offer some reflections on the subject of judgment, uh, being judgmental. Well, you know, what do we mean when we say that? Uh, growing up within Christian contexts, I often heard comments about God's judgment, uh, especially from Protestant sources. Uh, I don't know that the Roman Catholic uh, context preached about God's judgment very much. Some would say that's good, some would say that's bad. Depends on how you look at it, I suppose. But I'm not uh, today wanting to focus so much on who's right and who's wrong and shame on you or great for you. I think we need to first begin by figuring out what exactly is it that we're talking about. I've often made the comment that I'm not so sure God judges us as much as we judge ourselves, that by our own actions and choices we bring negative things upon ourselves that we wouldn't otherwise need to bring, but at the same time I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not wanting to condemn or judge or uh, be an adversary to the victim in those cases. I think if we're going to answer the question of, did I bring this on myself, the only one who can legitimately ask that question is oneself. It's not a question that can be legitimately ever asked by another person. I think, it, in general, I would like to invite all of us uh, to make a regular habit of looking in the mirror and saying, did I do this? Not because I'm asking someone else to answer it for me, but because I'm open to the possibility of uh, contributing a, a mixed bag of influences and choices to my life experience that I myself sometimes I get it right sometimes I don't either way I get the consequences of my choices and hopefully by my experiences I learn how to make better and better choices for someone else to come in and say oh the reason this happened to you is because to me, it's, it's always walking on thin ice because that other person has a real strong danger of being self-righteous, uh, may also be wrong. Uh, I mean, there have been numerous times where medical doctors would insist that this is the reason that such and such condition developed and later find out that that's not the reason at all. Um, or they thought they had all the evidence, but they overlooked one little detail that would have cast things in an entirely different light. The, the basic problem of being judgmental toward oneself or toward anyone else is that it starts with uh, a perception or a feeling or um, a conclusion before all the information has been collected before adequate maturity and understanding have been developed. Kind of like the old adage that says, I've made up my mind, don't confuse me with the facts. The problem with the facts is it's, it's kind of like that one show I did with a friend who uh, was in, uh, she was very involved in quilting. And one of the witticisms we came up with in that show is that how much you see depends upon how closely you look so that the closer and the closer and the closer you look at something, the more you discover new information and how many times I've been in situations where new information comes to light and my first thought is, oh, well, if I'd have known that, I never would have come to that conclusion in the first place. If I'd have known that, I wouldn't have been so angry about it. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have been afraid. But because I don't have all the information I want or need, I find myself in these situations of sometimes being coerced by circumstances to make conclusions and to uh, choose strategies when I simply don't have all the information I need to do better than a 50-50 chance, you know, or maybe I only have a 20% chance of getting it right. And sometimes maybe a 20% chance of making the right choice is enough. but. It seems to me there should be 
there should be. I, I hope there are ways that by gathering more information, by keeping our ears and eyes open, by communicating, actually sharing notes and comparing perceptions and, and calling to another, how does it look from where you're standing? And how does it look from where you're standing? And Well, this is how it looks from over here. How could these three completely different perspectives all be talking about the same thing? It, it, I mean, it kind of goes back to the poem about the six blind men and the elephant, uh, written by John Godfrey Sachs back in the middle of the 19th century, that um, essentially uh, it's a long poem he wrote, very eloquently, I might add, that speaks of six blind men in uh, the Middle East, uh, uh, middle of Asia actually, uh, Pakistan, India area, uh, going out uh, to see an elephant and six blind men and an elephant. And each of them walks up and grabs part of a, uh, grabs hold of a certain part of the elephant and begins to assume that the part he has touched is representative of the whole elephant. So that you have the ear, the tusk, the side, the leg, the tail, and the trunk uh, and six different pieces of the elephant, all completely different from the other pieces, and corresponding to, let's see, the tusk, uh, the man said, the elephant is very like a spear. The ear, the man, the blind man said, the elephant is very like a sail, like a sail on a sailboat. The trunk, the blind man said, the elephant is very much like a snake. Uh, the tail, the blind man said, the elephant is very much like a rope. The leg, uh, the blind man said, the elephant is very much like a tree. And finally, the blind man who touched the side of the elephant said he, that the elephant is very much like a wall. And so they had these six completely different objects that were all based on partial perception of the elephant. The whole point of not being judgmental is putting all the facts together. And the whole point of being judgmental is keeping all the facts apart. That you specifically do not integrate the facts, you don't reach for the truth, you base uh, your conclusion on a very partial perception uh, that in the moment, you may not believe is a partial perception. You may believe this is the complete perception. And it's not until, you know, it's, it's like my friend and I decided on that quilt. The, how much you see depends on upon how close you look. If each of the six blind men had spent more time looking more closely at the elephant, feeling every part of the elephant, going around and around and around the elephant, however many times as it took to discern all the parts of the elephant. The judgmental attitudes and the arguments would have been completely unimportant and probably would never would have happened. But because they based so much upon initial perception, uh, I mean, that's essentially what judgment is about. It's taking a piece and declaring it to be the whole. Uh, in a sense, making somebody accountable to a single negative implication of an action or characteristic. Uh, that because of this, well, everything, every part of it has to be the same. Well, every part of it isn't the same. And every part of life is not all good or all bad. Life is what it is, but what it is is a combination of so many different things that an elephant looks simple by comparison. The, the question, I guess, uh, with regard to judgment, being judgmental or, or judgmentalism or judgment uh, period, is that the, well, the question that was posed by one friend is, is this simply part of being human? Is it part of being human to see only part of something? Perhaps. I, I don't feel comfortable, however, saying I don't feel comfortable, however, saying that to be human is to view anything, everything, in partiality. I think to be human, for me, is to be curious about the elephant, 
and to want to know all of the parts, not just the first part, but the first part and the second part and the third part and all the parts. And even when you think you know all the parts on the outside, there's still all the parts on the inside. Uh, what kind of digestion, digestive system does an elephant have? Uh, that it can be eating leaves and trees in such extraordinary quantities. Uh, what kind of skeleton does an elephant have that it can have these enormous tusks out in front and not wind up with all kinds of chiropractic problems and neck strain? Uh, you know, there's some sort of balancing act between this huge trunk on the front of the elephant and this tiny tail on the back of the elephant. Um, what about the diameter and the, the strength and thickness of the legs? You know, uh, how could this animal with this big flat foot uh, live in a place where, you know, yes, there's sandy deserts and meadows and so forth, but the ground is not as flat as the bottom of the elephant's foot. And um, there would, of course, be times where the elephant would need to go up and down different things. Uh, how did the elephant adapt to all those situations? You know, could you make the judgment that the elephant is ill-equipped to deal with this or that circumstance? Um, could something that weighs that much and be that huge actually float when it got to the river? Well, of course, elephants can swim, but how do they swim when they don't have any flippers? They don't have any flat part of their body. Uh, they have to essentially swim using paddles that are round logs, not flat, um, and yet they manage to swim. Uh, the best recommendation, I guess, when it comes to the whole subject of being judgmental is to withhold judgment for as long as possible and to keep eyes and ears open and to keep uh, accumulating um, perceptions and, and not just perceptions but perceptions and also the testing of perceptions. This is what I think I saw. This is how I would confirm that it is what I think it is or, or that it is what I think it was when I first saw it. I can say for example I I just saw my neighbor drive home and someone say, how do you know this? I said, well, because I saw their car drive in the driveway. Well, what is their car? So I identify the color, shape, make, model of the car. Okay, then we walk down the sidewalk and look into the driveway and, well, there's a car of that color and that size and shape, but lo and behold, it's a different make and model. You know, one was a Toyota, the other was a Honda, uh, for example. Uh, it could be two different things that look so much alike that based on a two-second glance, I didn't see as much as I thought I did. I could be judgmental and say, no, I'm sure I'm right, um, and ultimately be proven wrong, which erodes my integrity, does nothing for the conversation, drives a wedge in the relationship I have with that person with whom I was talking. Or I can be open-minded and, and not be judgmental and say, well, let's find out. Uh, because the English language, uh, I mean, I don't know that I know enough languages to say if it's more inaccurate than others, but I find it horrendously inaccurate even having grown up with it. Um, I'm not terribly proud of English because there are so many easy, easy, easy ways to misunderstand it. And when it comes to this whole subject of being judgmental, it's, it's not uh, a Christian phenomena. It's not even just a phenomena pertaining to people of faith. It's, it's pertaining, I think, to all interaction uh, between humans, to all languages and cultures around the world. The extent to which we are willing to form preconceived notions about each other that can get in the way of our communication. Uh, the extent to which um, we stumble over our own words quite literally. We stumble over our own ways of being. Uh, because we use words that have predispositions and, and leanings to them. 
it would be easy to ask, for example, what kind of car do you drive? Uh, and be basically neutral. It would, one could also ask, however, uh, just by changing a few words, something like, you don't drive one of those cars, do you? And immediately there is this implication that there is something negative about the class of cars to which I referred. And it dampens communication because if the person drives one of those cars, they may not in fact embody or embrace whatever objection I have to that particular kind of car. Uh, I had a four-door 1968 Chevrolet Impala, which was a very large car when I was in college, for example. Uh, one could say, oh my God, it's a horrible gas guzzler. It's, it's got to be polluting the atmosphere and all sorts of things. Actually, it got 23 miles a gallon on the highway, which was way more than most of the cars of friends whom I knew in high school who would talk about having a car that was so old it was burning oil and got six miles a gallon. Mine got 23 and it never burned oil. Uh, so it was a very good car, very well constructed, very reliable. Um, I basically drove it to 164,000 miles with no major repairs and at that point had to drive it to the junkyard because the frame itself literally rusted apart. But, um, you know, and then, and then it was only a matter of time till the whole thing would have fallen apart right in the middle of the road. But, uh, but up until then it was the most remarkable car. But it was easy for people to look at that particular car and make a judgment about it because of its age, because it was a bit rusted, uh, because of how large it was. And a lot of those judgments would have been wrong. Uh, why would they have made those judgments? Well, because they had seen other similar cars that did have the problems that they described, that they ascribed unfairly to my car. Uh, you know, there was another perception that older cars somehow were beaten down, worn out, sluggish, etc. Uh, to which I would smile and say, oh really? Because uh, for all of its uh, age and a bit of rust on the fenders and whatnot, uh, my car still had a very reliable uh, four-barrel uh, carburetor under the hood, which I, for those who don't know much about cars, I'm. I'm not an expert on cars, but basically that means that when I was on the highway, uh, I could cruise along very fuel efficiently, uh, you know, very smoothly. Um, I actually added a cruise control to the car myself, uh, which is about the limit of my abilities. But, uh, but if I needed to pass somebody or if a situation developed where I needed to get somewhere quick, I could simply push the accelerator to the floor and in a matter of two seconds, it would go from 55 to 85. It would just take off like a shot. I mean, it, the car had immense power. But it was astonishing to people because the car didn't look like it would. In a similar sort of way, there are a lot of very, very knowledgeable and wise people walking around in the world who don't look like they should be as wise or knowledgeable as they are. And if we prejudge those people as having nothing to contribute and don't give them the opportunity to demonstrate what they can do, we'll never know and we'll never be blessed by just how powerful they are. Imagine for a moment how incredible it would be if when we look at each other, we envisioned uh, mysterious treasure troves of undiscovered capability instead of seeing only the limitations or the irritations we've experienced in the past. You know, someone who is too full of questions, someone who is too aloof, someone who is too overbearing, someone who is too whatever. There are so many different reasons for why one might consider others to be too this or too that. Sometimes it's our own inadequacies that we're projecting. Sometimes it's that the person really was inept in a particular situation, but we're not in that situation anymore and there's no reason to project the ineptness they demonstrated in that moment onto another completely different moment. 
they may in fact be a completely different to now because they're not in the environment they were then. But we have to give each other that chance. In being judgmental, we don't give each other a chance. We reach for a conclusion before the case has even been presented. That's where it becomes really, really problematic because it's not ultimately based on truth. It's based on a essentially a fabricated lie, uh, an untruth that was pieced together possibly even from bits of truth, but pieced together in a way that makes the final conclusion no longer true. You know, like saying that, uh, oh, if you took pieces from a whole bunch of different cars and put them all together and said that this was a truly desirable and beautiful car, and uh, of course it's it's not, it, it looks like a mistake, a kind of, well, I'm reminded of the country western song, One Piece at a Time, uh, where it, it's kind of a comedic song implying that uh, this particular man uh, was working for a General Motors uh, plant, uh, or re correction, General Motors? Yeah, I'm testing my knowledge here, uh, of details. In any case, he wanted a long black Cadillac, and so he was working at the appropriate car plant and decided he would steal the pieces of the car one piece at a time. The problem was it took him so long to steal all the pieces that the design and construction of the car had changed over that amount of time uh, because it took 20 or 30 years to steal all the pieces. and what the car was like at the beginning and what the car was like at the end was so completely different that when they tried to put it all together they wound up with something that was so ridiculously asymmetrical and out of sync with itself uh, that uh, it, it became a laughing stock and and basically they when they drove it down to as the song goes when they drove it down to the courthouse to drop a title on it uh, and they said so what year is it and he started saying you know, it's a 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, you know, listing all the years of all the parts. And it became an impossible task, and uh, everyone couldn't stop laughing about it because of what a ridiculous venture it was. I suppose the other ridiculous venture that it reminds me of was the, uh, the story, as it was told to me, was a disciple of Buddha who came rushing in one day, uh, very proud and grinning from ear to ear, so thrilled that he had uh, finally, after 20 years of trying, learned how to levitate from the second floor of his house to the first floor. And Buddha basically replied in astonishment, 20 years? Why didn't you get up and use the stairs? Because uh, the whole point was not, to the Buddha, was not being able to levitate, but the point of getting the job done. Uh, you know, was it a worthy investment of time? Uh, there was some, you know, in that situation, there was some judgment involved that said that levitating from the second floor to the first floor was so important that it was worth 20 years of investment. Uh, and Buddha, of course, had a different opinion that 20 years of investment for simply levitating from one floor to another, you know, to what practical use can that ability be put? It, it ties into values, but it also ties into preconceived notions, but additionally ties into our relationships. When we engage in judgment, we drive wedges in our relationships. When we engage in love, we suspend judgment, we listen, we watch, we gather all the information, and we allow collaboration that otherwise would never happen. Uh, And yet we live in a world that is so filled with judgment, it's hard to know where to begin to move humanity into a new paradigm, to move from being judgmental into being loving, to move from being fearful and competitive into being genuinely collaborative, to putting all of our best abilities together and finding that ultimately we are the best resource we've got. It's not the machines, it's not the money, it's not the resources, it's each other. It's our own ingenuity and our own working together that can make all the difference 
in human history that any of us ever needs. To do that, though, has to begin, as with so many things, with simply daring to love. So in that sense, I guess, the, the best prejudgment I'd like to offer as we begin to wind up this show is the prejudgment that love changes things for the better, that if we can be ever uh, ever growing, ever improving, ever refining our understanding of what love is and putting the most genuine, unconditional love that we can into every situation, uh, to be putting love in that holds people accountable to doing their best, that doesn't enable them to be their worst, that doesn't enable them to be uh, lazy or unmotivated or to simply sit in their depression but the love that says you have experienced a loss mourn that loss process that loss and move beyond that loss you have experienced rejection mourn that rejection process that rejection and move beyond that rejection you have experienced being judgmental yourself mourn that judgmentalism, process it, and move beyond it to a way of relating to your fellow human beings and to all of creation in a more loving and informed and intelligent and truly just manner. May one and all and everything blessed and loved ever be. Thank you for watching.